Psalm 1 is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Whenever I was a, a middle school dean at Wonder Valley, I always included this in the memory work, and I don't remember how many points I gave for it, but it was significant. I just love Psalm 1. It's sort of personally remarkable to me that I've never preached from it before officially, although I've referred to it, and some of the thoughts may sound familiar from other, other things and other places. My intent, four out of the next five Sundays, including today, uh, is, to, is to preach from Psalms, from Psalm 1 to Psalm 30. Four Psalms out of there. I was going to do that in November. One Sunday in November, we're going to do something a little different. But uh, we're going to start today, and I just want to encourage you. If you're not sure what you're going to read through during the month of November, don't have already a, a fixed Bible reading plan, perhaps you can take a Psalm a day, beginning on November 1st, coming up here in a couple of days, and read through Psalm, Psalms 1 through 30. And uh, some of those we'll be talking about here on Sunday morning. Psalm 1 says this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give you thanks for your holy word. We take serious your command to preach the word as it is always in season. And I pray that our hearts are prepared, that you would teach us where you'd have us taught this morning, that you would use me in what I prepared as you see fit. And I pray that as we look into the mirror of your word, you would show us that in each of our own lives that needs to be corrected. Help us to repent where we need to and to give honor and glory to you by what we say and do in Jesus' name. Amen. There are 150 psalms, and they were not written in the order in which we find them in Scripture. The very first psalm that was written was Psalm 90. That was written about 400 years before what we're looking at as Psalm 1. The very last one was Psalm 126. That was written about a thousand years after the first Psalm, Psalm 90, was written. There's quite a span there. Most of them were written by David, but of course over that span there are, there are others. And he has written more of them than anyone else. This Psalm does not have a name attached to it. But it's believed that Ezra is the one who eventually took the Psalms and put them in the order in which we find them. And he chose this psalm to open up the book. And it, I believe it is strategically placed. Ezra was a man who preached the word of God to his people. And he understood that any time that there was a gathering of public worship, there was going to be a mix of people. There were going to be a mix of those who were faithful to God and who found favor with God because of their faith. And there would be those who had not yet committed to the Lord in faith or were only pretending to do so. And I believe he chose this psalm so that it would be the first one. If someone got hold of a carefully copied uh, structure of the psalms themselves, the very first one that they would come to is this challenging one, this challenging reminder. And whereas the people memorized these songs, many of the Jewish people had all 150 of these psalms memorized because they, they were drilled in these things and they took different ones and they sang them over and over again, that this would be one of the most important to read and to consider and of which to remind oneself. And so uh, we begin to take apart this with verse 1. He says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Now that word blessed, back about six months ago, we went through the Beatitudes, and I believe that Jesus probably was following the pattern of Psalm 1 when he began his Sermon on the Mount with blessed are those who, blessed are they who. 
And, and so this word means a kind of happiness that cannot be understood by those who are not faithful to God. This is a state of joy. This is a state of joy that cannot be understood by the person of the world, by the person who is not faithful to God. This is beyond normal human happiness. Wouldn't we all like to be happy in the way that God describes? You know, God does not want us to walk around often downtrodden and downcast and dour or, or looking as though we are the, the pickle sampler for the, for the local factory. He wants us to enjoy a kind of joy that he has prescribed for us and he has laid out in more than one place in his word how to enjoy this happiness. The word happiness is related to the word happens or happenstance. And often human happiness is based on what happens. My football team won, so I am happy. Oh, something happened at work that wasn't good, so I am not happy. And human happiness is fleeting based on what happens to us. But this sort of blessedness about which this writer writes is the kind of godly blessedness that he wants us to have and um, and which he wants us to show and to display and to experience. He said, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. Now I want you to know there there are three things he mentions here in verse 1, and they are progressive. The first one, walks not in the counsel of the wicked. That describes someone who is trying to be faithful, and yet they're considering and weighing the, the advice of those who are ungodly. Because they're weighing it, and because they're not firmly rooted in the word of God to be able to discern that which is good and which is right, then the counsel of the wicked is going to sort of overtake them at a time. This is a more passive thing. This is, this is someone who is just sort of diminishing in his fear of God and is starting to neglect his duties before God to walk in the counsel and advice of the ungodly. And what happens is that leads to the second thing we find here, or stands in the way of sinners. Now, stands in the way of sinners does not mean, here comes a sinner, I'm going to stand here, and I'm going to prevent him from getting to his sin. That's not what it's talking about. When, it's, when it talks about standing in the way of the sinners, the way of sinners is like a pathway. And sinners are going along that pathway in a certain direction. He doesn't say those who walk in the way of sinners. He doesn't get that far. He says those who stand there, those who have gotten up to the point of it, and they're just looking and they're considering. And they might finally be brought along by those who are going along the path. That's the second part of this progression. First, you just kind of listen to their advice. And then second, you, you stand in the way of the sinners, and, and then that leads... Uh, to sitting in the seat of scoffers. Now that word sinners there, we're all sinners. But the word that's translated there, sometimes the English language falls short. It, it talks about those who are open and gross sinners, openly defiant of God. That leads to the third thing, sits in the seat of scoffers. And the picture that he's drawing there is people sitting around and they are out loud vocally mocking the things of God. Now, it's one thing to walk by and notice there are people sitting there openly mocking the things of God. And it's another thing to take a seat along with them, which, which implies belonging. This is the progression of the one who walks to, in the advice of the wicked, gets along in their path, and ends up just openly, blatantly mocking and defying that which is holy, those which are the things of God. And he says, true happiness a kind of godly joy that cannot be experienced by those of the world belongs to such as those. Say, so is, really, is there really such a joy? Is there really that depth of human happiness, the kind that the world does not understand? Yes. Now, this is not to say that sometimes people will say, well, if you become a Christian, then, uh, then bad things will no longer happen to you. You'll be happy all the time. That's, that's not what I'm trying to say. That the kind of joy, the kind of blessedness of the person who avoids these three things is the same kind of blessedness that allows a man to be in a Roman prison, to be chained to a member of the Praetorian Guard round the clock and write such things as, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. The first step is to avoid 
avoid that which carries one along in the way of sin. Well, now the second thing, how do, how do we do this? Well, verse, verse 2 tells us how one does avoid those three things that are mentioned in verse 1. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. That word delight, that is a searching test. And as Ezra or whoever it was put these psalms together and put this one first, they meant to lay this test before us. Because, you know, there are only two kinds of people in the world. The, the blessed one is mentioned here and the one who is not blessed as mentioned here. This is a searching test for us. I am one or I am the other. And that test is highlighted in that word in verse 2. His delight is in the law of the Lord. I mentioned this in Sunday school a while ago. Our teens were combined with our most experienced church members. And I, and I mentioned to them that uh, I feel like I'm all the time talking about read the Bible and pray, read the Bible read and pray, read the Bible and pray. I've even mentioned from the pulpit that sometimes I feel like that's all I've talked about. But when the day comes when, when I feel like I no longer need to say that because we're all such prayer warriors and we're all such hungering and thirsting after the Word of God, then I'll, I'll stop mentioning it. But so much in Scripture reminds us of this. Read the Bible and pray, read the Bible and pray. And as much as I mention that, there is a danger. The danger is that you'll go home and you'll read the Bible out of a sense of obligation. Well, he keeps mentioning it. Well, it sounds like it's important. Okay, I'd better do it. And that is as pleasing to God as someone who does or gives things for their spouse out of a sense of duty. Here are your flowers. Happy anniversary, honey. Okay? This is a searching test for us as we examine the one who was blessed and the one who is not, in Psalm 1, we only need to examine our own affinity for the Word of God. Do I delight in the Word of God? Could I take it or leave it? Do I open it up out of a sense of obligation, a sense of duty? If you do not delight in the law of the Lord, if you do not delight in the Scripture... And hunger and thirst after righteousness, friend, that is a red flag. That is a warning to you. His delight is in the law of the Lord. Now, back then, when this was written, the law of the Lord only consisted of the five books of Moses. Many other things came along later, but that's all they had back then. And, and, and the same themes in the first five books of Moses are some of the same themes that we ought to consider for ourselves. What did Moses keep saying over and over? Remember who God is. Remember what God has done for you. Remain faithful to the Lord God who has done so much for you. And even here we are in the New Testament. We are saved by the grace of God through the blood of Jesus. And those things remain for us as well. Remember who God is. Remember what he's done for you. Remain faithful to him. And that ought to play itself out in our delight for the word of God. It says, his delight is on the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. And again, for all the times I've said, read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. I acknowledge, I think I mentioned this before, that the people of that time did not read their Bibles every day because they could not. Because the printing press, the uh, movable type and all that had not yet been invented. So what did they do? They went to the assembly on the Lord's day and they listened to the word of God. They listened carefully and what they heard they took with them. And day and night throughout the week they meditated on it. Now, the word meditated, as we find in Scripture, is not some sort of mystical cross your arms and, and your legs and mow and all that. It simply means to reflect on. It's related to the word that talks about a, a cow chewing its cud. A cow will chew and chew and chew on the cud in order to get every last drop out of it and to take it in and to ingest it. And that's what they would do. They would hear something from the word of God. It would be read. It would be taught. And then throughout the week, they would think about it night and day. How does this apply to me? How can I love the God more? How can I remember the things he's done for us? Wow, what he, do, what he did for the, the children of Israel, leading them out of Egypt, or whatever the scripture was. Or wow, someday, 
The chosen one will be sent. They would meditate and think about it day and night. What does that suggest for us? It suggests that it is an important integral part of our lives. That we, that we understand that our Christianity is not a weekly or twice weekly thing. That it is the foundation of our lives getting to know God and hungering and thirsting after more of him and feasting upon his word. What does it say about such a one in verse 3? He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and all that he does he prospers. He is like a tree. What kind of tree? A wildly growing tree out in the field somewhere? No, he is a tree planted. A tree intentionally put in a certain place by streams, plural, streams of water. Why? If it's intentionally put there, that means it's cared for. It is cultivated. And it's going to draw water continuously. It's always going to be refreshed. It's going to be big. It's going to be firm and leafy and fruitful. And those streams of water are going to help it to yield its fruit in its season. Well, what is fruit as far as we're concerned? Here in the New Testament, we understand from the end of Galatians 5, the fruits of of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Love, joy, peace, patience, etc. Now what does it mean yields its fruit in its season? You know, sometimes, you probably notice this, sometimes the weather plays tricks on the local vegetation. Sometimes it's, it's supposed to, okay, we've had warm weather, and now it's supposed to start getting cold, and it's supposed to continue staying cold, but we'll have Indian summer or some, some stretch of warm weather, and something will start to bloom again that was not supposed to do, that do so until the following year. And maybe even a little fruit or something, maybe, maybe a fig will be produced here or there, and it's, it's, not, uh, it's not going to be good fruit. Producing fruit in its season reminds us that the fruits of the Spirit for us will come in the season that we, we need them to. That we will be able to show love when we are mistreated. That's in its season. We'll be able to show joy in times of trial. We'll be able to have peace in times of turmoil. Those fruits will show themselves in season for us to glorify God in the way they ought to. The leaf does not wither, and in all that he does, he prosperous. It's not talking about wealth. This is not the prosperity gospel. This is talking about spiritual prosperity. He will flourish. He will, like Paul, be able to say, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. How you doing, soldier who's chained to me 24 hours a day? But to have a joy that undergirds and, and helps him to have the, the kind of depth of happiness that God intended for us. Now, there are times of grief. There are times of sorrow, but there is an underlying joy that we have if we are firm and rooted and constantly nourished by the law of the Lord in which we delight. Beginning in verse 4, we have the, the flip side, the contrast. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Not so. All that that we found about the, about the first man is not so. Is he blessed? Not so. Does he have yield its fruit in its season? Not so. Does he delight in the law of the Lord? Not so. He is like the chaff that the wind drives away. Now, to understand the chaff, of course, we have big farm machinery and all kinds of things. Back then, uh, the, the person who was growing wheat, if he had some sort of a mound on his property, he'd, he'd build a threshing floor there. And he'd gather his wheat, and he'd, he'd set it up there. And, and when it was windy enough... He'd take his pitchfork and he'd stick it in the pile and he'd throw his wheat up in the air. And uh, those heavy kernels, the, the good part, would just fall right back down to the threshing floor. But the light, fluffy, useless chaff would be blown away, taken away, never to be bothered with again. And all that was left is that which was good. That's the description of the godless man, of the ungodly man. They will be taken away. Someday in judgment. Talks about that in verse 5. Therefore the wicked will not stand 
in the judgment. That does not mean the wicked will not go to the judgment. He will go, and he will stand before the throne of God, but he will not stand insofar as surviving the judgment. As a matter of fact, we can fully expect him to fall upon his knees or fall prostrate before the throne of judgment and cry out that Jesus is Lord, regrettably too late because he didn't acknowledge that during his time of life. He will not stand in judgment, nor will sinners stand in the congregation of the righteous. In any sort of public assembly of the worship of God today, you're probably going to have a mix of those who merely profess the faith and those who truly possess the faith. There's a mixture of that right now. And Jesus talked about the wheat and, and, the, and the tares growing up together. But ultimately, one day, there will be a separation. And God will separate those who were truly faithful and believed upon him and for whom his salvation applies and those who simply gave him lip service. Those are the only two choices. There is no gray area mentioned in between. We, we, we only wonder which one we are as we look into and we compare ourselves to these two and to the characteristics that, that are thereof. There will be a separation one day, perhaps between a godly wife and her unbelieving husband or godly parents and their unbelieving teens. There will be a separation one day and those who did not call upon the name of the Lord for salvation, they will be carried off and only the righteous will remain in heaven as we worship together. Only those who received Jesus as Lord and Savior and, and did so with an honest heart of repentance and receiving his gift of salvation will remain. In verse 6, it says, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Now that, when it says he knows, of the, way, knows the way of the righteous, that just doesn't mean he's mentally aware of it. He knows, he's mentally aware of the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. But it means he is intimately familiar and intimately involved with the way of the righteous. He knows those who are his own. He watches and he is, is involved with those whom he knows. So two options. Two options are set before us. They are extreme opposites. And as I said, there's, there's nothing in between. And as Paul wrote to us, he said, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. To search yourself with this test. What do I delight in the law of the Lord? Or would I rather just avoid it altogether? May it increasingly be said of each of us that we delight in the law of the Lord. Such that we want to meditate on it day and night. Such that we avoid the path of the sinner. We avoid the seat of the scoffer. And we we look to the Lord to help us in repentance to obey Him because of the free gift of salvation that He's given. It may it increasingly be said of each of us that we delight in His law and that we prosper spiritually. Let's ask for His help. Lord, thank You again for Your Word. I pray that You would help us each to search our hearts. Lord, there's so much in the Psalms that is of, is of comfort in times of chaos we know that this is a very important one with which to begin to help us look into our own lives and understand whether or not we're showing fruits of true saving faith or if we're just giving you lip service and half-heartedness. I pray that you would help us to examine rightly our own hearts, that you would help us faithfully to, to serve and obey you in gratitude for the free gift of salvation we have through your grace and through Jesus having taken the sin, the punishment for sin that we deserve. I pray for anyone here who's not received him as Lord and Savior, that you would help them to understand the importance of this matter and the urgency, and that you would help us to minister to them in taking care of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Every Sunday morning, we give an opportunity for you, if you'd like to publicly express your desire to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, to come forward and let us know, and we'll make arrangements to open the Word of God with you and discuss this important matter. If you're a baptized believer and you're not a, a member officially of Calvary Christian Church and you'd like to identify with this as your home church, 
we invite you to come forward and express that as well. And again, we'll look into the Word of God with you and, and see to this matter. Do you have a spiritual issue for which you'd like us to pray? We invite you to come forward for that also as we stand and sing our song of invitation this morning.